So the year was 2005. Three former PayPal employees had recently left to start a little website called YouTube, and Desperate Housewives was the leading show in living rooms across the U.S. I, meanwhile, while found myself hunkered down in the conference room of one of the nation's leading advertising agencies. The snow was just starting to fall outside of the windows of our Minneapolis headquarters. We represented some of the nation's largest brands. United Airlines, Citibank, BMW, Purina, Virgin Mobile, Sony, and that particular afternoon, we were debating how to spend a $20 million budget to launch a new product for one of our clients. And it was in that meeting that I had an epiphany. And it came from two sources. One, we were talking about a massive amount of money, and our biggest debate was whether or not we should spend it in TV or print or online. And this was a time when new ad skipping technologies were coming to the forefront, like TiVo. Fast forward to today, we all do it, right? We want to spend time with the content we want to spend time with, and we skip past those ads. Yet we were only focused on the advertising that is skippable. The second epiphany came from the fact that I grew up in a family where volunteering was very important. But in recent years, I had become more and more involved in things like Big Brothers Big Sisters and the Salvation Army. And the Salvation Army is a really great organization that focuses on longer-term solutions. The teach a man to fish versus give him one philosophy. And it occurred to me just how much money we were talking about. And when I contextualized it against the fact that for 1% of what we were talking about, you could clothe, house, feed, provide hygiene and rehabilitation if necessary for 200 people facing homelessness for a month. For 2% of what we were talking about, you could feed 55 families of four in need for a year. And we were talking about 50 times that, just for one product, for one client, in one conference room at one ad agency. What do you think we collectively spend as a world on advertising? $10 billion? $50 billion? Globally, we annually spend $500 billion with a B on talking about our products and services and selling people things. And it was in that moment that it struck me. What could a company do if they were focused on doing good for their customers alongside selling them products? Could those two things exist together? Do we have to think of it as for-profit and non-profit? Or could you truly make the lives of your customers better alongside of your own success? Now, I wasn't some sort of pie-in-the-sky thinker, all kumbaya. I had certainly spent a lot of years working on really major brands, and I was very aware that all eyes are on the bottom line. But I really believed that even though leaders are judged by results, I believed that companies could hold themselves to a higher standard. Why can't you achieve your business results, but do good for the very community that you serve on the way? I truly wanted to test whether or not, as a company, you could do well by doing good. So I moved on to the corporate side, and I wanted to test this thesis. So we kind of dipped our toe, uh, small bets as we called them. And I started a company called United Health Group, largest health insurer in the US. And at the time, employers were really struggling with the rising cost of health care. They were starting to do things like introduce high deductible plans in order to share those costs with their employees. But nobody was thinking about the root cause of needing to insure someone. Nobody was focused on the actual health of the employees. And so I pushed for a program where we would go into employers and work with their employee population against their health goals, tobacco cessation, weight loss management, hydration, activity, whatever it happened to be, in order to make the employees healthier, therefore reducing health care costs. We were still achieving our business goals. We were still insuring people. But rather than just focusing on insuring them once they got sick, we were focused on trying to prevent it in the first place. You would know this now as the wellness campaign at your employer. They're very common today. But at the time, no other health insurer was focused on the root cause of why insurance was becoming so expensive. I then moved on to try and test this theory at Allianz, one of the top five global financial services brands uh, in the world. We worked on improving transparency and fiscal literacy because we saw this as an epidemic problem and knew that the right kind of financial uh, products could lead to a more peaceful existence and retirement. 
After having tested this at a healthcare company and financial services company, I truly believed that if we could do it, any company could. But I still was struck by the fact that as a culture, we are so focused on results and on winning. Think about your favorite college football team. Picture the MVP. You're so happy when you read that he spends the offseason volunteering at the local children's hospital. But come game day, that player, the coach, the team, everyone is judged on the final score. And it could not be more true in the corporate world. But I truly believe that we could think about a different path to winning. None of the other leaders ever challenged me and, and said, no, we shouldn't do good for our customers. But they believe that this is a luxury only afforded to companies like Tom's or Warby Parker, companies that had built their entire business model around social good. But I believed that we could still do it. And so I wanted to find a company where you could truly redirect your entire marketing budget towards improving your customers' lives alongside of your business goals. I wanted to prove that you could truly do well by doing good. There's a ton of talk today about brand purpose. It's almost becoming a little bit of a marketing catchphrase, and to be frank, I'm getting very tired of it. What I'm talking about is brand action. Actually putting your money where your mouth is and doing something for your customers that matters. Not just saying you stand for something, but actually doing something. I think our marketing industry, our business world is capable of this kind of change. So when I got a call to turn around a 100-year-old company that was known for a legacy product that was in decline, but had transformed into a business that offered marketing services for small businesses, I knew this was the opportunity. The company was Deluxe. And we had been in the business of helping people reach their financial goals and, um, and run their small businesses for over 100 years. But we had evolved. But the big opportunity was that either people didn't know the name Deluxe, or when they heard it, they thought of checks. So whenever I started a new company, I liked to go out and spend time with the customers. The customers we really wanted to reach were small businesses. And so whenever I go out and meet with them, I want to hear about the pain points, what it's like to be them, how do they make purchase decisions. And I was so struck by their stories. When you hear a small business owner's story, you want to support them. Think about here in North Adams. When you hear that Pete added ice cream at Empire Cafe because he has memories of going downtown and getting ice cream with his sister, you want to go in and get a cone. When you meet Becky Miner from Miner Combat and you hear about her passion for the youth, you want to join her gym. When you put a business owner's face to a business and their story, you want to support them. I also took a look at our competition, and our competition was so busy selling small businesses stuff, 99 cent business cards and build your own websites. It's confusing and it's noisy and it's certainly not honoring to the small business community. So I felt like we could sit in a different space. We could be the storytellers and the champions for small businesses, and we could be the ones that turn the spotlight and talk about the importance of supporting small businesses. We could do good for the entire small business community, all while we're trying to raise our awareness and change our perceptions. We could do both things at the same time, and that's when the small business revolution was born. In our first year, we went across the country and we told the stories of 100 small businesses. And we did these through films and through photo essays and a longer form point of view piece about the importance that small businesses play in our communities, in our neighborhoods, to our economy, to our country. And at the end of the day, we truly wanted to create a movement. This wasn't about deluxe. This is about how important it is to support small businesses, how hard it is to run a business, and how much the local support is necessary for them to thrive. And the momentum just took off. We truly had created a movement. In our first year, we reached 12 times more people than we could have if we would have invested that same amount of money in paid advertising. Over a thousand stories were written about the small business revolution and why Deluxe was doing it and why small businesses were so important to us and to our country. That was probably about 997 more stories than we could have gotten written about Deluxe's business transformation if we had just been talking about ourselves. And more importantly, 
it was a thousand more stories than perhaps would have been written at the national, regional, and local level about how important supporting small businesses were. We truly had created a movement, and we wanted to keep that momentum going. But one of the things that we noticed when we were going across the country is that nowhere are small businesses more under siege and struggling than in our small towns. It is really hard for small businesses to compete when you've got big box retailers moving in on the edge of town, highways rerouting around the main streets, you've got national restaurant chains, it's pushing these mom and pop shops out. These people who are trying to invest in the community, who are trying to raise kids, who growth to them looks like hiring someone else from the community. And so we wanted to do something about that. And so we took the small business revolution to the main street. We wanted to do more than just tell their stories. We wanted to tell their stories and help them. We wanted to prove this thesis of just how vital small businesses are. Because we felt like if we could prove that small businesses are vital to small town success, we felt like we could compel more and more people and inspire them to support small businesses. We wanted to prove this thesis that if your small business core does well, an entire town can thrive because of it. And so we issued a contest where people would nominate their favorite small town, and Deluxe would invest half a million dollars in revitalizing that town's main street. We would work with the businesses within the town. We would film the transformation. And the reason that we were filming is because we wanted to scale. At the end of the day, it was one town, one main street. But we felt like with the show as our platform, more people could watch it. It helped us continue our storytelling. We felt like other businesses could learn from the lessons. It's essentially a makeover documentary show. And so we wanted small businesses to use this as a resource. And the ripple effects of this have been huge. We're now entering into our third season of the show. And each year we go out and we visit 10 small towns and meet the small business owners, shake their hands, hear their stories, find out what makes that town unique. At the end of the day, there's a voting process. Last year, there was a million votes to determine that Bristol Borough, Pennsylvania uh, was the town that would be featured in season two. But at the end of the day, only one town can win. But what we love about this program is that all 10 towns are energized by the visit, by the process. In season two, North Adams was one of the finalists. And as they can attest, the community feels different. There's something about someone coming in from the outside and saying, you have something special here, and celebrating it, that reignites your passion for the small businesses and for your community. And the ripple effects of this program continue to amaze us. From helping a struggling barber who was under the thumb of his landlord to move into a new space and thrive and finally buy that house to helping a bridal shop owner who was over $100,000 in debt, had never paid herself, get to the point where she paid herself for the first time last year, and is actually changing the entire bridal industry by going to dress manufacturers and asking them to change their purchase minimums. The stories go on. The ripple effect of this has been huge. And Deluxe is so proud that instead of just making an ad campaign about ourselves, saying, hey, we used to be a check printer, but now we do marketing, Instead, we are putting our money where our mouth is, and we are actually helping small businesses. We have started a national conversation, and we are continuing to invest in how important it is to advocate for our customer base and small businesses. And so, how can companies do this? I wish we had time to go through the whole brand exercise, but it comes down to basically five basic principles. First of all, you have to find your brand purpose. Truly ask yourself, what would the world be missing if you weren't in business? It has to be that heavy. Why do you exist as a company? And this cannot be something that you determine in a boardroom by consensus. This has to be true and authentically you as a company. What would the world be missing? You have to find your brand action, your unique brand action. What can only you do to advocate for your customer group and truly make their lives better? Not just sell them things. How can you enhance their lives? And it doesn't always have to be a fiscal investment. It can be your mind share. If you work for a water purification company, what are you doing about the global water issue, for example? Get buy-in. It's so important that everyone at your company understand what you're doing. They're going to want to try and measure an effort like this the same way they measure the efficacy of two different headlines in an email marketing campaign. But you can't. You can't measure what you're doing when you are moving hearts and minds alongside your customers. And so you have to really focus on making sure everyone understands what you're trying to achieve and that things like this take time. Four, you really have to keep it authentic. There's going to be so much pressure to convert these, this to leads. How do we take all these people you've reached and you're the entire social community and how do we sell them something? 
And so you have to be a champion for keeping it authentic. It's the only way it works, and it'll cannibalize it if you ever waver. And fifth, you have to spread the word. Again, by the time we've gotten to our third year now, we've reached 14 times more people than we would have if we would have invested what we're investing in these communities in paid advertising. And it just feels so much richer because these are not just people we're reaching. These are lifelong fans. We are reaching hearts and minds and creating brand love that you could never achieve with just an ad campaign. We still use paid advertising. It's still a great way to amplify your message, but we're talking about our brand action when we use it. And so I truly believe that with great privilege comes great responsibility. As companies, we have to hold ourselves accountable to more than just selling things. There has to be more out there than just making money. Imagine a world where every brand thought about their brand purpose and how they could actually turn it into brand action for their customers. And then just imagine what kind of a world it could be. Thank you. Thank you.